punish me for my contempt for authority. Fate made me an authority myself. Albert Einstein. In 1996-97, I began my investigation at NASA. I decided who can I talk to at NASA to do an investigation into unexplainable phenomena. And at the top of my list were astrophysicists and astrochemists. I looked on NASA's website and found the email address for Dr. Joseph Nuth III, the NASA head of astrochemistry, and started a dialogue with him that turned out to be very successful. He first told me that NASA was making observations of unexplainable objects entering the Earth's atmosphere, um, detectable only in the ultraviolet range of light, something that was very peculiar to me. The idea that an object could only be visible in the ultraviolet suggested to me a quantumized, very, very energetic object, and it was not visible in lower spectra of light, was very, very curious. The scientist who headed the investigation was Dr. Louis A. Frank, and Frank basically made observations on satellites that were roughly 25,000 kilometers uh, away from the Earth, orbiting the Earth at a very, very large uh, radius. And these satellite, the satellite was called Polaris. The Polaris satellite was taking pictures in the, um, in the far ultraviolet of the Earth. And he started to notice these impacting objects that he called small comets. They were about 40 feet wide, made mostly of water, and he detected they were made mostly of water. He didn't know for sure, but they were made mostly of water, and they were impacting the, at the Earth at a rate of about 10 to 20 million impacts a year. Okay, so that was where I started. Those objects apparently were fluffy, house-sized comets of very low density and looked like energy balls. They actually didn't really look like water, and he wasn't sure they were made of water. So I decided to write Dr. Newth a letter at NASA and ask him about these things to see if there was any similarities to these and these alleged UFOs that were showing up on the black and white video cameras of the space shuttle. I wrote him, Dear Dr. Newth, if these little meteors are hitting the Earth's upper atmosphere and dissolving, wouldn't the intense solar radiation break the H2O into oxygen and hydrogen separated, thus releasing tremendous amounts of oxygen into the upper atmosphere? When oxygen undergoes further solar radiation, O2, oxygen, transmutates into O3, ozone. Could these space meteors be actually healing our ozone layer? Is this proof that there is a God? Please answer. I wasn't actually kidding about the ozone question because water basically is made of hydrogen and oxygen. And when water is exposed to the intense radiation from our sun, x-rays and gamma rays with temperatures that are off the chart as far as humans could possibly bear. And even ultraviolet light, we know, is much hotter than, than visible light. Uh, we know that because we get skin cancer when we allow ultraviolet light to penetrate the Earth's atmosphere, and it can actually cause very serious damage to our skin. The first question about these objects being water to me was, how could water transit from one point in space to Earth and actually survive this intense radiation? In theory, in space theory, space is minus 273 degrees centigrade. It's freezing in space. But as soon as any object, like any gas, liquid, or object appears in space, it basically gets bombarded by tremendous radiation from the sun and tremendous radiation from the stars in the form of X-rays and gamma rays and ultraviolet light and so on. And the temperatures, the nuclear reactions that go on in the water would be so intense, the water would burn up in a matter of seconds. These are allegedly 40-ton balls of water doing 35,000 miles an hour, but how did they get here? How did they come from the vast distances of space and get here and remain as they are? It has been known for a very long time that the Earth is under constant bombardment by extraterrestrial material, 20 kilotons per year, most of which is micron-sized dust shed by comets and asteroids, as well as some finite number of larger meteors. The house-sized comet proposal is in addition to this known flux and is unique in that these bodies are supposed to consist mostly or almost exclusively of water. Because no satisfactory mechanism has been proposed to explain their survival in the interplanetary medium or their non-detection by a variety of other means, example, IRAS, COBE, and I IEU, 
Most scientists do not believe that such bodies actually exist. The general belief is that the observations are valid, but the interpretations are wrong. If the interpretation is correct, however, the rate of deposition into the Earth's atmosphere of oxygen or water is only a minute fraction of the amount that is already there, except in the uppermost layers. For this reason, additional oxygen would be much too small to measure. If large masses of meteoric material relative to the mass of the Earth's atmosphere are to impact the Earth, the effects would be disastrous, even if the impactors were only made of water. So he's saying that these small amounts of water that are entering the Earth's atmosphere don't have the potential, in his opinion, as the head of astrochemistry at NASA, to produce a significant amount of ozone to cure our ozone layer. But he does understand the fundamental problem. Most scientists don't believe these detection, the detection of these objects are real because none of them show up on infrared satellites. Infrared is heat. And again, if intense radiation were hitting these balls of water and they started to heat up, you should get a very, very high heat signal that should be detectable on infrared, but no signal appears. So the mystery gets very, very deep about what these objects may be. Dear Dr. Newth, thanks for the info. So the phenomena couldn't be from the comet. However, how could any object made mostly of water in liquid form survive in space over any great distances unless it had some kind of phenomenal membrane to protect it? Wouldn't the H2O, as you observe, absorb the intense radiation from the sun and produce heat so much that it would dissolve the H and the O? If the temperature of cold space is minus 273 degrees centigrade, and upon exposure to direct intense radiation from the sun, tremendous heat is formed. At 1800 degrees Fahrenheit, hydrogen separates from oxygen. How could such an object travel in space for even a minute, let alone travel from one point in space to another, unless? Again, um, I'm proposing the problem of how these objects detected by Dr. Louis A. Frank in the ultraviolet, how could they have possibly arrived at Earth? In theory, they could not. It didn't make any sense to me how they could. He immediately wrote me back. Dear Mr. Sarita, you have enumerated a few of the problems with Frank's hypothesis and probably now realize why few scientists think that the phenomena seen by Lou Frank are actually common. No one doubts that he has observed something in capital letters, just not common. In spite of the fact that many people are sure that Frank's explanation for his observations are incorrect, there has been no good alternative explanation proposed yet. I'm sure that there will eventually be one that even Frank can agree to. So this letter shows amazing evidence that NASA is actually detecting something in space that's moving, that's coming to our Earth, and it shouldn't be there. Something that defies all the laws of physics. If you remember what I said about the electromagnetic spectrum earlier, that we should be detecting an object in the high upper frequencies of light and not detectable in the lower, that, that would be evident to suggest that we're looking at a highly quantized object, which means a highly energized object. This detection fits all of those descriptions and all those criteria. But that isn't the, this isn't the end of my investigation. But for now, this is what, we, what I found out, that NASA was observing something out there, and they didn't know what it was. It was the first time that anyone at NASA could admit that there was an unidentified and unexplained phenomena happening in our skies, and that no one had the answer. Dear Dr. Newth, Thanks for the email response to my question. I'm amazed at how such a phenomena can be observed, yet it's a denial of its existence because it doesn't fit into the theory of the solar system. What are the chances that the H2O house-sized objects are tailing from the recent passing of the comet hale box? Any ideas? If you have any more thoughts on this, please send email. Thanks. Dear Mr. Sarita, I would agree with your amazement in the scientific community ignoring Frank's observations if it were true. However, that is not the case. I know of no individual that does not believe that Frank saw something. The controversy centers just on what it was that yielded this signal. He believes that house-sized comets of very low density are responsible for both the recent detection of water and his previous 1985 obs observations using the DE spacecraft UV cameras. Few other people agree with him. By the way, those previous observations would mean that the phenomena would be a continuous process rather than one associated with a particular comet such as hale Bosch. The reasons are many, but the best center on the fact that these objects should have been detected on several other satellites, such as COBE, IRAS, and ISO. Those are infrared satellites. These satellites have instruments that are very sensitive to radiation in the infrared region. These fluffy, house-sized objects should be at a temperature near 300 K or even higher as they near the Earth since 
very fluffy objects are much better absorbers in the visible than they are emitters in the infrared.